Come on in, come on in. <laughs> yep. I didn't know it was like, Acts chapter 15. <laughs> yep, Acts chapter 15. And uh, we'll see if Joe and Yolanda popped in. We talked about them too. All good things, Jen, all good things. That was Joe right there. Yeah, from all, behind. All good things. Well, uh, we are in Acts chapter 15, and we began that chapter last week. And I'm just going to pop up my trusty little map. I know Jason loves the maps, and uh, as I do too. And uh, we were talking about having a map uh, teasing last Wednesday. Like, oh, you don't have a map? And uh, we got through, I think, the first three verses of chapter 15 last week. Uh, so we're going to go through this week and put um, the first 11 uh, verses here on, or 12, excuse me, verses on the table here. And then just kind of, uh, you know, look at the map here and remember by way of review that we are on the first mission journey and, and actually just completed the first mission journey uh, with Paul. And who was Paul's companion on that first trip? Barnabas. Barnabas, good. And actually, I guess technically he had two companions when he started, right? Who was the other one? Mark. Good, uh, good. John Mark and uh, Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark. Excuse me, but uh, remember as they sailed and they left Antioch, uh, Syrian Antioch, they got to the island of Cyprus and uh, started witnessing, started spreading the gospel, and immediately we know that there are two responses, right? There's always two reactions to the gospel. Uh, there's either acceptance or rejectance, uh, if you want to say. And, um, you know, so we saw some that were receiving it gladly and listening, and then we saw others who were opposing it and, and rejecting uh, not only the gospel message, but rejecting the messengers, right? And so they ran into a little hardship even in that first place. And from there, from Paphos, remember, uh, Mark returned back home. Paul and Barnabas sailed on to the area and the region up there of Galatia. And uh, just remember those are names like uh, Perga and Pamphylia, um, uh, Syrian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derb. Uh, these are cities of Galatia. And so they went to all these cities. And really, the, we've seen some themes here, right? Some of them, uh, any of them pop out to you? Maybe you guys can grab the microphone for a minute and, uh, and kind of catch up. I know we've got Chris here and others who haven't been here maybe keeping up with our, with our study. Uh, what are some of the patterns or themes we've seen on this mission trip? Good. Yeah, I like that. That's probably one of the primary ones, right? Yeah, Lord is, pros uh, Lord is uh, spreading the gospel, and certainly persecution is happening. Yeah, good. What else? Um, the church, even early in its inception, I know, which it is present, is not without its internal struggle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Outside and within. Good. Good, yeah, and that kind of ties into where we're springboarding from last week into this week, right, in this council uh, as we come to the chapter 15 now. And so, uh, you know, remember the pattern we see also of Paul, uh, where was he taking the gospel first? To the Jews. To the Jews, right? He would enter into the synagogues in these cities that had synagogues. He would go to the Jews. Uh, they would give their time of reading the scriptures. He would then present Jesus and, and point to Jesus from their scriptures that he is the fulfillment. He is the Messiah. And, uh, and call them to believe. And so again, we saw many Gentiles and some Jews uh, rejoicing greatly and, and coming to faith. Uh, but then we also saw the other side of the coin is the Jews who were getting angry uh, at Paul. And, uh, and that really started, like I said, at the beginning, but it really started to amp up in Pisidian Antioch up there and uh, where they moved, remember the leaders of the city and uh, forced Paul and Barnabas out of the city. And so they left, they went to Iconium and uh, you know, same types of things happened there. So they shook off the dust of their feet. They moved on to Lystra. Uh, what what of significance happens in Lystra? Paul almost dies and he gets up and goes back in. Awesome, good. Yeah, remember Paul and Barnabas. Remember how uh, they were actually uh, they healed a lame man, and the people were saying, "Oh, these are gods." Remember uh, Zeus and and uh, Mercurius, or or whatever the words are there, and and uh, saying they're gods, and they tore their clothes, and they said, "You know, we are just men." Told them about the God of the Bible, uh, and then the Jews from Antioch and Iconium chased them down and followed them. So they've been following Paul and Barnabas on this trail, and uh, so very hostile. And they get to Lystra, and they actually start pummeling Paul with stones and think that they killed him and dragged him out and left him for dead and out of the city. And as Sky reminds us, uh, he hops up with no broken bones, no, no, you know, 
injuries and uh, and walks back into the city where they just dragged him out of, and uh, and, and just keeps going right. <clears throat> and then he goes to Derby, and now they've circled back around to check those churches. One of the great verses I think of. Um, is when he comes back and he says that it is through much tribulation we must enter the kingdom of God. Uh, remember the application that we talked about in, in that, uh, that uh, that is the case for all of us. It's not just for Paul because he got stoned or Barnabas or the early church because they got persecuted. Um, you know, Paul writes and tells Timothy, all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. Uh, Jesus tells us, uh, John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation. Right, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And so <clears throat> we know that this is par for the course, if you will, right? This is uh, what comes with uh, uh, the inheritance of being in Christ is not only the glory that we will one day uh, receive and be with for, from him, but it also has to do with the suffering of Christ. And we, we tend to not focus on that side of the coin too much. I think of Paul, I think it is in, the, in Philippians where he says, uh, it has been granted to you, not only, and which is great to understand, because remember, uh, salvation is a gift of God's grace, right? And he, he writes, I think, in chapter 1 of Philippians, he says, uh, it has been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for his sake. It's, it's and. <laughs> it's, it's been granted to you to have that. And so, again, this is the internal inheritance that we look forward to in heaven and all those things. But what comes with it here is persecution, is tribulation, is trials, is difficulties. And so we've seen that, you know, in full force here on this trip. Uh, they make their way back to a port city here, Italia, and they sail back to home base, which is Antioch uh, in Syria. And so last week we began in chapter 15. And, uh, and so let's go ahead and hit it uh, in chapter 15 and read the first 12 verses. And uh, let's just kind of go around the horn. Uh, we've been doing that on Wednesday nights. I think it's a good practice. Uh, make sure we've all seen it in our own Bibles and practice our uh, out loud reading, if you will. So uh, I'll start on Greg's side. And if we'll just kind of go around the table, everybody read one verse. And uh, if we get to the end of the horn here, we'll just start on the back table there somewhere, okay? Thank you so much. Acts 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Uh, ESV version I've got, so I apologize. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles, and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And when there had been much discussion, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of God the gospel and believe and God who knows the heart bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and he made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by faith now therefore why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples uh, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are all the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles father we give you thanks for the work you've done among the Jews and the Gentiles uh, for the work you do in your people uh, so, Lord, we just give you thanks for the work you've begun. Thank you for the work you can continue even here this morning as we get into your word. Lord, we pray that you would uh, grant for our time to be 
beneficial to our sanctification and honoring to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we got through the first three verses last week, and, and we read through them as just a quick recap there, uh, remembering that now uh, there's been a dissension. They're in Antioch, so remember they're back in Antioch now. They're reporting all the stuff that happened from this uh, trip. Uh, Barnabas, you could just picture him saying, like, dude, they picked up rocks and stone Paul to death, man, <laughs> and you should have seen what happened. Uh, and so uh, that's my best Jewish accent. I don't know, uh, Jewish imitation, I guess. So... Um, I guess I'm thinking back to the surfer dude we were talking about, right? The dude guy last week. Um, so, you know, all that to say, they're they're recapping and, and they're all rejoicing over the work of the Lord. But then there's some believers here uh, who come from Jerusalem. Uh, they're Jewish, you know, converts, Jewish believers. And they come down and they are saying, look, uh, these Gentile believers, it's great they believe in Jesus and all, but they got to be circumcised. They need to follow the law. They need to do all the things that we've been doing our whole lives. And so uh, we see a contention. It says a great contention or a great debate uh, was, was happening now between Paul and Barnabas and these Jews. And so they say, hey, let's take it down to the church in Jerusalem, go to the apostles and to the elders and the church leaders. And, uh, and so we see this first uh, church council, if you will, this first ecumenical uh, church council that happens. And in that, uh, these are important things because they're going to decide, we talked about this last week, they're going to decide what the orthodox or what the true belief is to be. Uh, they are the apostles, and they are going to say what the doctrine is about this salvation. Uh, and so that's what we're going to see. Somebody remind us, what, what do we call these Jewish believers who are saying you must also hold to the old covenant things? Judaizers. Judaizers. Good, okay. Uh, so we're talking about these Judaizers. So uh, it gets back now, verse 4. Uh, they arrive at Jerusalem. And remember on the way, I don't want to miss that part too, because we, we had a lot of application in that, verse 3, uh, you know, that while they were on the way talking about this, so they're traveling, and look, Antioch is up here, uh, it's not on our map, but Jerusalem is like down here, here's Damascus, Jerusalem's like down here somewhere, like they got a pretty good journey, you know, they're not Ubering here, they're, they're walking together this long trip, and so they're talking together, and Paul and Barbas are telling them all about this trip to these Jewish believers, and though they had discourse remember though they they were on different sides of the, of the thing here the debate here uh they were rejoicing in the work that god had done and so they weren't missing like the big picture of god is doing this work and they all rejoiced in it together and so we find great joy and comfort in that too so now they they, re, they return to jerusalem and or, or they make it to jerusalem they report to the church there all that god had done uh through them and so what would that mean uh, what what are they relaying now to the church of Jerusalem? Okay. Yeah, which the church, the apostles and people at Jerusalem would understand to your point, Jesus, the new covenant as their believers. But I think, you know, you're hitting it right on when you say the grafting in language, right? Romans eleven, grafting into the Gentiles. Uh, because they just told Paul and Barnabas are in this group with these Jews. So they're coming back. The first thing they relate to or relate to James and Peter and the apostles and all the church is listen to how this mission trip just went. So they just told it at Antioch. Now they're at the Church of Jerusalem and they're giving them the report again and saying, listen to what God is doing out there. This we're seeing amazing, awesome things. And then again, Paul, you know, uh, Paul was stoned, right? Like he, just the story, you know, of of their reports. Um, and so they're telling it to the church here at Jerusalem. Jerusalem too, so that they can know what's happening. Uh, but it says here now that some of the Pharisees, right, verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who had stood up, uh, excuse me, who had believed stood up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. So we're seeing the same thing happen here that was happening in Antioch. But a little bit of difference, I guess. Why was that happening in Antioch? Were there Jews in Antioch who brought this up to the church? There were, but where did they come from? They came from Jerusalem. Remember, the Pharisees from Jerusalem came to Antioch because they heard of the Gentiles there, and they told them, no, you must also do this and this. Now they come back as a group to Jerusalem, and they hear Jews in the, in the home-based church at Jerusalem saying the same thing. So it brings us back to what's happening here. Okay. I think. Why are, 
why is this happening at the church at Jerusalem? Why is this a struggle right now? Because it's all they've ever known. Yes, it's got to be so hard for them to like drop all that stuff mm. that they've followed so closely all their lives. Yeah. That God directed them to do. Amen. They can't embrace that God is not having them do that anymore. Amen. I think that's They're kind of losing their salvation if they stop doing it. You know, Maybe. Or, Maybe. So they it, don't and it says they believed. Okay, so I do want to take that to say, you know, they, they received by the church the Pharisees who had believed. So Tradition. we think, what's that? Tradition. Amen. Right. We think that they're believing in Christ, but again, remember the spectrum of we don't know and see when it is the Holy Spirit is drawing someone and saving them and where they are in that process. So when we come to salvation, we can come to salvation and still have all these other thoughts that are wrong, right, and inaccurate that have to be reshaped and retrained. And how does that happen? Dying off to your old self. Yeah. And what else? Sanctification. Yeah. Learning. By the power of the Word of God. The Spirit of God that's going to continue that work in you. And how does He do that primarily? Holy through Spirit. His Word. Reading. Right. Through His Word, through reading it, studying it, uh, being under sound preaching and teaching. That's why these things are, are so important because uh, we looked at that last week, right? As we were doing the greetings in Romans 16, I believe it was last week, yeah, where uh, I pointed out, uh, I spent some time talking about when the, he greeted Prisca and Aquila. And we talked about Priscilla and Aquila and who they are, and that they were dear friends of Paul's that he had met, uh, you know, at Corinth. And they, in fact, left Corinth and tr went over to Ephesus with him. And they met a man named Apollos. You guys remember that? And so we found out about Apollos. He becomes a leader and a pastor in the early churches. He's, in fact, a pastor at the church at Corinth for a while till he leaves because of their disobedience and carnality. And that's when Paul starts writing these letters to the church at Corinth. Like, you've, Apollos is gone. You guys aren't listening. You're not doing right. That's why he's these two huge letters. And he's made other trips to Corinth. So this is a church that are working on hard. And all that to say that when Apollos first met Priscilla and Aquila, they were the ones who heard him, that he was bold, he knew the ways of the Jewish, he believed in Jesus, but he didn't know well the ways of Jesus and the gospel. And it says Priscilla and Aquila took him off to the side and better explained to him the ways of Christ so that he knew more about the gospel and about the faith. And so just an example, again, to say, let's not be too harsh to say these Pharisees, you know, um, aren't believers you know that's not for us to decide are they somehow trying to work out their salvation they are but do they do they understand that that's what they're doing who knows and that's the huge significance of this discussion right that the, the church is having i mean we could sit here and have it for all of us who have uh you know uh scar tissue from you know growing up in the roman catholic church i can think of greg i can think of me i can think of elaine i there's many of us uh who grew up in the roman catholic church and uh to speak to your point chris the tradition the things they had known their whole life you grew up in school this way you grew up in church this way and and you come to find out at some point lord willing when you're saved you come to find out oh these things aren't biblical oh these things aren't right oh this isn't what we have to do oh it's not believe in Jesus and do this and do this and this is really the key right is it's adding to the gospel right is what this is what it's, comes to my mind um, is <coughs> what you presented about um, Apollos yeah. need, needing to learn in this setting where Paul finds himself. He doesn't sit there among them and go, oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> and he especially makes that clear when he writes to Galatia, making it clear that when he went to Galatia, it wasn't because he had first come to the Jews to learn what he should be saying. What he was presenting was directly from Christ himself. Yeah. And so that he didn't need to then come to this moment and go, oh, oh. Right. Yeah, can I say something? And he was the first one probably to truly figure out grace because what he had gone through and these other guys hadn't caught that train yet and they didn't have the New Testament to read because it yeah. hadn't been written yet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so you can for context for context. I just want to make sure I understand the context. 
the context is becoming right with God as it pertains to salvation, correct? That's all. That's the context of this chapter. Right. Yeah, and that counsel. Not being right with God in order to be a, a, a disciple or a follower. Good. Yeah, like I think it's the context I think you're right on is right salvation. With God for salvation. Right. Okay. Right, because, uh, and I think you had a great point to everybody to, to bring in this whole context of what we're talking about is, is, is believing in Jesus as Christ and Messiah enough to save you? That would be like the question, right? If, if we pose a question for them that they're trying to answer, maybe that's how I would word it. And that's, so now you've got the, you know, the Jews on this side. And, and I think in this, and just like in any church, like we talked about at lunch the other day, there's always going to be unbelievers in there. But to some degree, whoever these believers are, there's Jewish believers in there, and now there's Paul and Barnabas, who are Jewish believers also, coming in to speak on the kind of on the side, the Gentile side sitting over here and, and presenting what they're saying Christ has taught them. And, uh, and so they're getting these revelations. You remember, Paul's getting this revelation from Christ. Uh, Peter and the apostles got these teachings from Christ you know, himself. And now at this point, you know, remember we're at uh, this, just for a recap reminder, this first missionary journey took about a year, like 48 AD roughly, okay? So uh, let's just go for round numbers and say Christ uh, died and ascended and all that and say 30. So we're, you know, within a 20 year period here. And so there's been a, a two decade period here of sanctification for a man like Peter and the apostles who we see don't, it seems like, oh, they don't get very much when we get the account of the Gospels. But near the end of the Gospels, we find out he breathed the Holy Spirit on them. He revealed to them the truth of the Scriptures and what it says. He's developing them and sanctified them now for two decades. The, these are different men now than what we read in the Gospel. I want you to understand that. Uh, because Peter and them would be on the, on the the with Paul on, on this. Jesus is the Messiah. This is how we're saved. And we're going to see that here in this gospel. But I think, or in this chapter, I think you guys bring up, you know, and hit the nail on the head about what they're struggling with and what the problem is in this church. I think we're still struggling with that today in hey. a lot of ways. Amen. It's just not, maybe not just the Jews. It's everybody. Yes. It's the whole, is faith enough? Or do I also have to have good works? Do I also have to be yes. baptized? Do I also have to give to the church? Do I also have to, you know, be married to one woman? All those things are after you have yeah. faith. Good. But they're trying to get it on this side. Good. Because they're good things. Some of the church right. practices, some of the things they believe in, I think that's where the struggle is, is that they weren't bad things, some right. of them. Right. And so they're like... And they were commanded to do them. Yeah. So they, they're they obeying they're God in doing they're, those they're, things. Right. So they're right. like, oh, what about the law? Right. Like, it had to be really difficult to say... Exactly. To go By the way, every other them. religion in the world believes that. Yeah. Yeah. That we yeah. play a part... And even the nuns... In our salvation. Believe yeah. that. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Really think about it. Salvation by grace means we've got to be spiritually bankrupt, which means we can do nothing. Right. And it right. flies in the faith of the faith of human pride. Right. And um, that I can't do anything. It's, yeah, it's it's hard yeah. to say like that like that one parable Jesus says, Be merciful unto me a sinner. Yeah. And that man went on justified. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, so thank you, because I think the two of you just answered the question. You know, we were kind of talking around it a lot, but just so we're all on the same page here, uh, because I never take for granted that there's someone in this room that doesn't know the gospel and isn't saved. Do you need more? Do you need more than believing by faith that Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah? And they were just answering that, saying no. These other things are good things. Remember, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is where you can go to get a you know, to get a pin down on that. Uh, for by grace you have been saved, right? Through faith, and is not of yourself, it is a gift of God, right? Not of works that any man should boast. And then verse 10 says, for we are his, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has prepared beforehand. So the faith and the grace comes from God, and we are saved by that. But also, after that, right, however you want to word that, we are called to the good works that he has ready for us. The works are, are not um, bringing salvation. They're, they're not the root of salvation. They're the fruit of salvation. Right? You follow me? This is maybe an easy way to kind of say it so we can remember. Works are not a root or the cause uh, or the start of salvation. They're the fruit of salvation. The root is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
the fruit is the evidence and the works, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have questions about that? Can I say one thing? I've noticed that witnessing... No. <laughs> yeah. If you're witnessing somebody, you want to make it with, where you're looking at all the other religions, do and done. Right. You know, with yeah. every other religion, you've yeah. got to do something to do, do, do. way to heaven. Yeah. And with Christianity, it's done. And then I've had so many people go, oh, Right. Know that. Amen. And you can take that right to the cross, right? It is finished. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good. Good. Um, verse 6 says the apostles and elders came together. So we see that they are going into this, this matter, uh, taking it seriously. Um, and it says to look into this matter, or the word there is actually logos or logos, if you know what that word means. It means word. Uh, you know, and so. That's what it's saying there. Like, Logos is the Word. Uh, John 1 is full of that. The Word became flesh. Right in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, this is Logos. This is the Word. And that's what that word translated maybe as matter in, in the NASB that I have. So they were looking into this Word. They were looking into what it is is being said. They're looking into what is happening here. And so um, Second, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, I wrote that down. Uh, because, you know, just shows us in this council to be diligent. And there's been many a church councils, uh, to, to Jill, to your point, uh, trying to rebut some of uh, Catholicism and other things um, because um, of the deity of Christ being questioned. But, you know, there's all these questions that we're talking about on salvation here. There kept being councils after this because there was always issues and they needed to uh, land on what do they think about this. Uh, but 2 Timothy 2.15 uh, says, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of God. And so as individuals, that's what we're called to do. That's who we're called to be. Um, talked about the Bereans last week. I think they're probably in the sermon again today. And uh, just amazing how the Lord ties these things together continually and constantly. It's crazy. Uh, but Acts 17, again, Bereans, right? What does that mean? I know we're not there yet. We're only in Acts 15. When we get to chapter 17, we're going to be on the second mission journey. And we're going to come to a church in Macedonia. Where we, we've been talking about those churches in Macedonia and Achaia the last couple of weeks in our preaching in Romans. And, uh, and remember some of those churches. Berea is one of them. Why would I bring that church up? Well, in the laity were very intentional <clears throat> in taking what they're hearing and comparing with the Word of God to see if these things were actually true. Good. Yep, they were backing it up, right? Uh, they wanted to know what the Apostle Paul was saying. <laughs> and and they're, they're looking and taking the scriptures that they did have at that time that he would be speaking and teaching from and, and quoting from, and they're looking at the scriptures to see if it's in context and to see if he is being a good teacher and a diligent student of the Word. So how much more should you fact-check me when I say things? Are you with me? Or anybody else that you listen to? They are fact-checking the Apostle Paul. I think you definitely need to make sure you are checking people and what they're saying with the Word of God. Yes, sir? Um, so a couple things I'm curious on. With the Bereans, you know, back at this point in time, as Ed had mentioned, they didn't have a Bible to go fact-check against. What were they checking against? Like well, that, letters that had already been out? Yeah, I mean, you got the, they, they got the Old Christ. Testament. They got the Old Testament. They're checking against the Old Testament, but the Old Testament Good question. Good question. So we've seen through um, all these chapters in Acts so far, and I've tried to point out how in a lot of those chapters, I mean, I forget which chapter it is now, but the one certainly where Peter preached his sermon early on in chapter 3, maybe, chapter 2, chapter 3, and where uh, Paul preached his sermon um, here recently, they quote the scripture over and over and over. I think in Paul's there, he had like four or five direct quotes, Psalms, Isaiah, other prophets. They have those scriptures. And so to your point about the law and those things, they have all these scriptures in the Old Testament that say all those things are part of the bigger plan, which is through this Messiah. And that's the verses that Paul and them keep preaching to them to tell them Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. And that's in the Old Testament everywhere. Yeah, it was just, as Paul says, it was hidden. He says it was hidden in times past and more mysterious. Now it's been fulfilled, is what he says in his day. Right. 
So everything he was saying to them in the scriptures wasn't to go to the Old Testament to say, oh yeah, you got to obey this law and these works. It was to go to the Old Testament to say, no, faith alone in Christ alone. Right? Remember, who do they always go to as the prime example of this? Who, who is the, the epitome of who do we point to, to the Jews? Yeah, Nancy. Yeah, it's Abraham. Over and over and over, Abraham was, he believed God and was saved, and uh, he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Paul says in Romans several times, Galatians, uh, Colossians, other letters, all the time, pointing to Abraham and saying, why was he saved? Because he was circumcised? Nope, he was saved before he was circumcised. Was he saved before, uh, by the law? Nope, uh, he was saved before the law. And why was he saved? Because he did all the things that he knew of in the scriptures? No, he was saved by faith. And, and Right, Amen. and so the Old Testament is clear, salvation is by faith. Given to them by grace alone. Yeah. That was a gift in the first place. Good. Great question for clarification. Good. And good thought, too. Uh, those are the types of things, you guys, we got to continue to think through, right, process through, because uh, it can be difficult for when we're first starting off and we're less mature in the faith, right, and we're newer, uh, you know, we're newer in the faith, we're newer Christians, or even for those who have been saved for a long time, but they're still immature in the faith, these things are really difficult to work through. Uh, I remember being a younger Christian and asking my pastor, like, so how are people saved in the Old Testament? You know what I mean? And I'm sure probably, if you're honest with yourself, you've probably wrestled with that question earlier in your Christian life, because it seems when you're young and you're learning, it seems like these are two different gods. The God of the Old Testament looks different than the God of the New Testament. And the Old Testament's different than the New. You're, how were they saved in the Old if we're saved by grace in the New? And, and so these are good things for us to keep working through and, uh, and keep reminding ourselves of the truth that this council is going to get to here, right? Because what, what do they do? It says after, uh, verse 7, after there had been much debate. So there's just debate going back and forth, the argument here going back and forth. Uh, no, it's by faith alone. No, they also must have this, you know. And so uh, how do they come to a conclusion here? And notice, who, who are the ones, though, who are the ones that speak up? Who are the ones that say, listen, there's been a lot of conversation going on here. Let me just take the microphone and say something to you. Who are the ones that stand up and speak here? Who do we see? Peter. Peter. What's that? Peter. Peter. Yep. Who else? And we'll see more later. We'll see James, the brother, of, uh, the brother of Jesus, half brother of Jesus, is one of the leaders in the church. There, we'll see him looking in next week. But look at uh, verse twelve. Good, Barnabas and Paul. So we've got these men standing up. Peter stands up first and says, "Look, you know how God made a choice. How great that is, right? He has made a choice. That speaks to his choice and his election. That by the mouth and his appointment for um, look at for Peter. And this is interesting, isn't it?" Peter says, look, you know how God chose me to go to the Gentiles and tell them the gospel so that they would believe. When we think of the apostle of the Gentiles, who do we think of? Paul, right? And what Paul. a testimony he what has, Peter right? Says yeah. yeah, amen. And so uh, here, Peter is the one saying, look, I took the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, think back As well. to chapter 10. What is he talking about? we can remember i know it's been a sub, it's been several months how why would peter say that how does peter say god chose me to take the gospel of the gentiles His interaction with the, uh, centurion. yes good yeah the roman centurion right um who remembers what was his name cornelius. good good peter and cornelius chapter 10 and the vision uh coming down three times of the sheep and all the animals and showing not only is everything that everything that God says is clean is not unclean, including animals, but more importantly, including Gentiles. And Peter learned that lesson big time there. And when he preached to Cornelius in that household full of Gentiles, and they believed and were baptized, Peter well understood, didn't he, what the gospel is is all about, who the gospel's for, and it, it's for everybody. And so Peter, while we think of Paul, and he definitely is called the Apostle of the Gentiles, Peter, look, Peter is here in Jerusalem, at the church in Jerusalem. Paul is the one going out to the Gentile nations. Uh, and we know Peter will make trips also, okay, and write letters also. But the focus on the Gentile apostleship is Paul, and so that's certainly true. But it doesn't mean that no one else was called to, to speak to Gentiles, right? And so, uh, so we see that in Peter, and so he tells him, look, remember what happened 
You guys are a member of this. I reported this. You sent people down to inspect what was happening because I told you about it. And so they came back and testified to the things that were happening. And he says that, that God testified to them, meaning the Gentiles, and gave them the Holy Spirit just as he also did to us. For he made no distinction. And, uh, you know, Galatians is where um, uh, Elaine was, was talking about a little bit earlier, right? Galatians. And you'll see he talks about Judaizers, Paul does, in Galatians. And uh, in Gal let's go to Galatians real quick. It's not, a, it's not a far trip from Acts. So let's flip over to Galatians and look at these couple verses together. And, uh, yeah, Chris, did you have more thought on, uh, on what you were thinking there? You're just making a great point. What a testimony. You're speaking of Paul. Well, yeah, and then it's a great point in our daily lives because we all have, or not all of us, but most of us have a testimony to bring forth to help with people who are not saved. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and, and particularly as you say that, think about Paul's testimony to the Jews, right? Him being a Jew and being, you know, taught in Gamaliel and being this Pharisee and, you know, just being this high and mighty uh, pharisaical student and teacher, you know? So, yeah, great point. Uh, look at Galatians 3, verses 6 to 9. Anybody's, uh, anybody's got that can read verse 6 to 9, and then uh, and somebody else maybe uh, can pick up. Uh, George, can I get you to do 6 to 9? Absolutely. And uh, who, who else wants to read? Michael, would you mind? Sure. Doing 23 to 29 right after that? And you, uh, we 6 can... to 9, but again, an ESV version. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessing along with Abraham, the man of faith. Good. Pause there before we go on, Michael. So here's the verse about Abraham again uh, that he points to. And, and notice, look, Galatians 3 is a go-to chapter for the whole church, is uh, the church separate from Israel. Galatians 3 knocks that wall down. This partition uh, that is spoken about in actually in Ephesians 2 and, and then in Galatians 3, those are chapters that you can definitely remember on bucket list as when people, uh, dispensationalism, and I won't get into that uh, deep here, but dispensationalism and, and uh, ways of theology like that that I, I don't ascribe to because of exactly that. They say there's a distinguished difference between the of Israel and the church. And some will use what's called replacement theology to say the church is now Israel or Israel replaced the church. But some of them just say, look, no, we're different. We're saved the same way, but God has different plans in this way. And they make a wall and they say Gentiles and Jews are, are different. I don't know how you can say that and read Galatians 3 and, and much less study it. He's saying that those who are, you know, Gentiles are coming to faith the same way as Abraham. And now, look, here's the nail in the coffin, if, uh, if you don't mind, Michael. Verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, and kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you and all our sons of God, through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Therefore, I'm sorry, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all in one Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are of Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yeah, I just, again, enough said. Let the word of God speak, and thus saith the Lord, right? Um, all those who are in Christ, it says, are descendants of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. Because, as it said in those first verses that George read, it says that Abraham believed, and it says the gospel, did you catch that? Because that's an amazing verse. It says the gospel was preached beforehand to Abraham. Meaning way back in the Old Testament, Sky, to go back to your thought and question, in the Old Testament, how is it that Abraham believed? He believed, and what did he believe? The gospel. He was told the gospel by God and promised from Genesis 3.15 that this Messiah would come in and they believed in the promise of that to happen as we look back and believe that it did happen and that's both by faith and that's believing the gospel. And so 
Abraham believed the gospel. And, and we say, oh, well, he didn't even know who Jesus is. It doesn't even matter. He believed by faith just as you do and just as I do. And so that's what's counted to him. That's how he's saved. And, uh, and so in this, I guess, why do you think I bring that verse into this context of what we're talking about in chapter 15? Isn't that what they're talking about? So if they had the New Testament, they would go to Ephesians 2 and Galatians 3 and say, look at what this says. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. And so uh, that's establishing the one body uh, that we are together now here. And so now he says to them, uh, look at verse 10. So now that we're all in Christ by one way, and, and the Gentiles, you know, have been saved by faith the same way we have. And he says that twice in here. Them just the same as us and us just the same as them. And he says, you are now putting God to the test. So he's actually kind of getting a stern urging to them to say, do not do what you're doing. Uh, you are putting a yoke on the, these disciples, the Gentile disciples, that neither our fathers nor ourselves have been able to bear. What is that yoke he's talking about? Think of a yoke. Uh, I know it's not common in our, our day, and we've got five minutes. A yoke is something they would put on the oxen. They would have two animals, right, that would be pulling a cart or something. And the yoke is the thing they would put around its neck so that it could pull. And so uh, if there's two animals, it would be easier than if it was just for the one, right? But there's this yoke, and so it's the burden, right? That's why they're called beast of burden. Because the burden is what they're carrying, God bless you, through the yoke. And so he's saying, you're putting a yoke that is such a burden on these people that you know the history uh, at, the, at this time of however many, you know, 4,000 years uh, and, and, you know, of human history, but then just of the history of Israel, you know, throughout all of our history, our fathers could never bear this weight, ever. They could never hold up to the law. They could never do it and, and fulfill the righteousness and requirements. It, it burdened them to death. And now you want to put that on these people? Like, we can't do it. And we were given it in the word. And, and you want to put it on them. And he's saying, you're putting God to the test. Why would he say that? Because Christ couldn't bear it. Because he couldn't bear the whole responsibility. So we got to put some on you. Because we all sin. Yeah. We, we all fall short of the glory of God. Amen to that. Yeah, and so these, these Jewish, these Judaizers, right, uh, are putting God to the test by saying, you must also do this. Because in saying that, what are they essentially saying? Just believing by faith is not enough. That's why a Roman Catholic friends who, who believe the plus, 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 and, and, and are not saved. And I want to be clear about this. I'm not just picking on the Roman Catholics. We're, we're putting this context now of Jews. Jews who believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that you must be circumcised and obey the law to the best of your ability are not saved by the true gospel. And, and, and Paul says, that is not the gospel, and anyone who brings another gospel, let them be you know, anathema, cursed, because you are adding to the works of Christ, and there is no room for addition. It's the work of Christ alone that brings salvation. And so he's saying, don't do this. Don't put God to the test. Uh, you know, don't believe what it is you're saying, and certainly don't tell others and teach other people what it is that you're saying. Uh, which is going to again tie nicely into into our uh, next next hour. Uh, in reality, a, a, you can say all you want, but unless your name is in the book of life, you're not going to be saved. Amen. Hundred percent true. But in that, we know those who are in the book of life are there because they're chosen to believe by faith. It's not by any adding anything else that we can add or that we can do. And so, uh, in closing, and we'll have maybe a, a minute or two here. Um, you know, Peter says. We believe and we are saved through grace uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there you see we're saved through grace. And then back in verse 9, he said, uh, cleansing their hearts by faith. So right here, you see salvation by faith through grace. You don't just have to go to Ephesians 2 to say that's the only place. It's everywhere. And so here's faith and grace mentioned saying that's how we're saved. And so he's saying to them essentially, look, they've been set free by faith in Christ. And now you're just trying to put the the burden and the chains back on them to which they've been set free, <laughs> you know? And, and so in saying that you're doing it to them, he's saying to them, that's what you're doing to yourself. If you've been set free from the burden of these things through Christ, don't put the yoke of bondage back on yourself, <laughs> 
right? That's what that's what the key is to this. Uh, question: um, Did the, the Judaizers, um, the Judaism, did they did they believe that Christ's sacrifice was a sufficient sacrifice and there was no longer sacrifice? <clears throat> Well, I can't speak intelligently to each one of them. I don't know. Just like it says, they seem to believe still in the works right here. So they're certainly still holding on to the old covenant thing, and they're going to have to let go of all that. They're going to have to let go of all that. So I would say a lot. I would say a lot of them did, and maybe some of them didn't. You know, again, again, remember the seeds of which ones, and some of them look like they're saved, and then they're taken away, and they take root for a little time, and then they're gone. Like so, there's certainly I think people in that whole camp. And all this. Don't you think some, there's, yeah, there's no way for us to really know. Don't you think some of this is like to some not jealousy, but like, oh, they're like when someone has a trust fund, it's like they didn't work for it. <laughs> like, like you know, like they don't want it to be easy for them. They're like, oh, we worked our whole life for this. Is sure. Like, like they're just entitlement. entitlement maybe. Yeah, that, yeah. You yeah. know, like they feel yeah. like everybody. Should they got the easy the road. Right. They got the easy way. That. Hey, there's a parable about that too. You know, and uh, we get we got to close. But yeah, there's the parable of. You know the uh, uh, the landowner who puts the people into work in his vineyard, and he comes and he says, "You come yeah. in, we're brother, and work a whole day, and I'll give you a day's wages or a denarius." Mm -hmm. And so he goes throughout the day, and as the day is going, he brings more people and more people in. And so he brings one that's working essentially 12 hours. He brings another that's working six hours. He brings one in the 11th hour of the day, which means they worked one hour. And he gave them the same wage. And the people from the beginning are going, look, you paid that guy the same as you paid us. And we were out there, blah, blah, blah. And that's a parable of exactly this. Look, the first will be last. That, that Many are called and few are chosen. The first will be last. That's the idea behind this whole thing is to say that it doesn't matter. What matters is I'm the landover. I choose to give my money to whoever I want to. You see it? And, and that's, uh, that's the, the point here. And so um, as we close, next, you know, Bart. Barnabas and Paul in verse 12, uh, they speak, and just to kind of add on to this, you know, and, and uh, conclusion for today, that uh, they tell of the, the trip, they tell the mission trip, and look, here's what's happening, here's what God's doing. The Gentiles are coming to faith, and they're believing, and they're being saved, and they are, are exhibiting uh, the works of the Holy Spirit, just like you and I did back at Pentecost, and just like the Jews are here, it's happening all over the place where God is doing this, and they're not receiving that Holy Spirit and doing those works because they're circumcised and, and doing the law. Like, that's what Paul and Barnabas are bringing in here, right? To say those are not uh, things that are happening, and they're saved by grace and faith alone. And, uh, and that's really where we're going to close. Um, so let's pray. And if you have more questions or thoughts, we can talk about it uh, as we wrap up here and certainly um, after class or after service. Lord, we give you thanks for your good. Your mercies endure forever. Uh, they're also new every morning, and we're grateful and thankful for that. Uh, Lord, thank you for uh, just loving us. Thank you for the ability to comprehend your word. Uh, continue to please to grant us knowledge and understanding and application of the things that we learned here today, and uh, that we would better glorify you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.